In the production of a film, there's really three jobs that relate to what you hear in the final soundtrack. Three creative jobs which ultimately result in what you hear. One of them is the production recordist, which is a person who is recording during the actual filming of a movie. They'll have a microphone on the set and they will gather dialogue and some sound effects if they're available during the actual shooting. Secondly, you'll have a sound editor, and this is a person back in a studio who generally has a collection of sound or is able to go out and make new recordings with a portable tape recorder or something like that and bring them back and edit them and fit them into and add them onto the soundtrack of the film itself. And the third person is a sound mixer, and this is a person whose job is to blend together all the different sounds that come in to make up a soundtrack, such as music, dialogue, and sound effects. Uh, those types of positions have really existed since sound films first came into being in one form or another. The term sound designer has gotten usage in the last decade, really since the Star Wars films began a new interest in creative soundtracks in motion pictures. A sound designer, I called myself a sound designer because I really wasn't functioning just as a production recordist or just a sound editor or just a sound mixer. I did some of the job uh, that all three of those people might do. And, but I was able to follow through from the point of production of a film. That is, I could go out and advise and make suggestions about things that could be recorded uh, once I had seen the script of the film. I was on hand during some of the filming of the motion picture to gather sounds or at least see what was going on so I could run off myself and begin to manufacture and make sounds that I know we need later on. Uh, I was also uh, on hand during the editing of the film to function as a sound editor and that job would be to pick sounds out of a library of our own making uh, and edit them and synchronize them with the action on the screen. And also I'd be involved in the sound mixing. And it's not often that one person gets to move through all those different jobs on a film. Usually they're pretty strictly categorized and one person doesn't, you know, one sound recordist may not do any sound editing and the sound editor may not do any sound mixing. That's the tradition of the, the division of labor in, in feature films. Um, but since I was uh, an exception to that traditional division of labor, I needed to describe myself in some new terms. So I began to use the term sound designer. Uh, which essentially meant that I, although I emphasized my creative work in sound effects, uh, my job was to coordinate all that you heard in the final soundtrack of a film. A film such as Star Wars, the soundtrack is completely fabricated in the studio. Uh, probably on the average 15 or 20 percent of the dialogue which is in the final film was originally recorded on the set during the performance by the actors. The remaining 85% of that dialogue was added later with the actors coming back and replacing their lines of dialogue or different actors coming in to give voices to characters or monsters or puppets or something that might be in the show. All of the sound effects you hear in the film are added later. Everything from footsteps to cloth rustle to the handling of props to the sound of vehicles, weapons, aliens, and exploding Death Stars. Those are all things which didn't exist at the time of shooting. They had to be manufactured after the fact. And of course the music wasn't there during the original shooting. So all, all the elements which go into the final soundtrack, uh, are there's thousands of them really. And to keep track of it all, one has to come up with a system of identifying each sound, of giving it a name, uh, giving it a description. And so, as a sound designer, one of the things you do is to collect a lot of sound, categorize it, and you keep tapes on your shelf or nowadays sound stored on a computer disk. And it's very much like an encyclopedia. You have hundreds and hundreds of sounds. I think I have 6,000 tapes in, in, say, accumulated over 12 years of just sound design work. And, 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 and that uh, is a result of going out and recording lots of material, animals, aircraft carriers, jets, appliance motors, whatever it might be, bringing them back and you need to actually select from those tapes the things you find the most interesting and uh, categorize them and put it down on a, on a list so you can read it and find things later because your memory can't often hang on to every little detail and so you need to somehow make a catalog of sound which you can refer to when you're on the hunt for something specifically. So. 
part of being a sound designer is being a librarian, really, in collecting a lot of data and having it arranged in an organized way such that you or the people you're working with, the other editors or sound people, can find things in this uh, encyclopedia of sound. When I did Star Wars, it was the very beginning of my career, and I had a lot to learn. In fact, I knew very little, and so everything I did at that time was going down a new road to some extent. And just completing the film was a major goal <laughs> and, and a source of a uh, great deal of, of energy and stress and so on. When it came time to work on Empire, uh, I felt, based on the experience that I had had on Star Wars, the experience I had gotten, the feedback I had gotten, the, I had learned from my, you know, you make mistakes and you look at the things that are wrong with one film and you say, well, now next time I'm going to learn, uh, I'll do better. Uh, we had very high expectations for Empire. And, uh, and so, stylistically, I wasn't attempting to do something really different, but I was attempting to do the same thing on a much grander scale. Uh, because I knew what I was up against. The film was filled with a lot more new things. It wasn't, I wasn't going to just take the library of material made from the first film and just copy it over and use it again. I had all the same characters, and they did different things. The Wookiee said new things. R2 had a, a large part to play. Um, we had all kinds of new vehicles and machine rating and uh, different, we only had, the first film had one kind of TIE fighter and the Empire had three different kinds and we had quite a range of spaceships to deal with so they all needed different and new sounds. So Empire was just doing the same job on a grander scale with perhaps even higher expectations. A lot of what was done on Star Wars was done in a kind of innocence. Uh, those of us that worked on it were interested in fantasy or science fiction movies. We had no, uh, we did not anticipate the film would be generally popular. We thought maybe we'd please the science fiction fans that we knew and friends and this sort of thing. We didn't know it would become a sort of worldwide phenomenon. So when it came to doing Empire, we did feel, and I know I did, great pressure now that you had to succeed and do something on a much, great, you know, much higher level in order to get the same effect. And so it's a great deal of creative pressure to just outdo ourselves. And so on Empire, we, we did a lot more field recording. We went out and recorded, tried to record something new and original for practically everything. And uh, a lot more time was spent uh, mixing in stereo. The concept for the sound of Darth Vader came about from the first film, and the script described him as some kind of a strange dark being who was in some kind of life support system, that he was breathing strange, that maybe you heard sounds of mechanics or motors. He, he might be part robot, he might be part human, we really didn't know. And so the original concept that I had of Darth Vader was a very noise-producing individual. He came on, into a scene, he was breathing like some wheezing windmill. You could hear his heart beating, you know, he moved his head, you heard motors turning, and he was almost like some kind of a robot in some sense. And uh, he made so much noise that we had to sort of cut back on that concept. In the first experimental mixes we did in Star Wars, he sounded like a, an operating room, like a, you know, an emergency room, you know, moving around. Don't lose your temper. I'll come right back and give you a hand. Chewie uh, was actually the first voice that I was hired to work on. Back when Star Wars was just in a script stage, uh, they knew they had this character named Chewbacca who was going to have to act and appear in scenes with the other actors. And the question was, he, uh, what would he sound like? He's not going to speak English. He's going to speak some sort of alien animal type of voice. He's supposed to be an intelligent uh, language, but not English and not German, not French, not something we'd really recognize. It had to be something made out of animal sounds. In one of the first meetings I had with George Lucas, he, uh, we talked this over and he said something about, well, maybe bears would sound good. He had heard some recording maybe somewhere of bears um, growling and making uh, vocalizations. He didn't say where that was, but he said that'd be one of the things you might look into. And we had a list of 
different animals to go out and record. So in the sort of year I spent recording preliminary sounds for Star Wars, I collected lots of bear sounds as well as walruses and lions and badgers and sick animals and you know domestic and all sorts of things. And out of all these recordings, you could extract little bits of sound, little okay. grunts and moans and uggs and args and uh, purring sounds, whatever it might be. And I made, I collected, uh, put all on one tape essentially, all these sounds which I thought had emotional feelings associated with them. You play this sound, it sounded affectionate. You played this other sound, it sounded angry. And uh, in that manner, I kind of had these categories of little sounds that each had an emotional tone associated with it. So I began cutting those together to try to get a sense of speech out of Chewie and to also get something that would work well with the way his mouth moved. He, he didn't have articulated lips. He could basically open and close his mouth. So you also needed to create a sound which would be believable as coming from a, a mouth which was operating like his did. And uh, through a great deal of trial and error, uh, came up with a voice for Chewbacca in that fashion. So it's a voice which is manufactured completely out of uh, animal sounds, principally bears, uh, and uh, synchronized with the performance uh, that's shot during filming. R2-D2 was probably the most difficult voice to work on because it was the most abstract. Here we had supposedly a machine that was going to talk, it was going to act, it was going to draw on our emotions, it was going to be in scenes with Alec Guinness and work as another actor, yet it was a machine. It didn't have a face with a smile or a mouth or eyes or ears, and it couldn't speak English and it couldn't even mouth words. At least Chewbacca could make kind of animal sounds which you could attribute a personality to. The initial experiments in coming up with R2's voice were all directed toward making a machine type of language, something that would come out of a computer, out of a robot. And although the voices were very interesting, I think, which I made, they all seemed to lack a sort of human quality. They seemed too machine-like. Uh, and R2 was not really just a machine. He was also this lovable little assistant robot. And uh, it came about after trial and error and trying different sounds that one day uh, I just started making the sounds. I said, well, maybe R2 should kind of sound like this. And you'd imitate a little baby sound, ooh, ah, you know, something like that. It's a sound you might have heard a little infant making when they were learning to talk. Communicating some kind of emotion, but not using well-formed English words. So the idea came up to really combine this sort of human sound with the electronic sound. That way we'd still might be able to have the character of a, of a machine but get the personality and the emotion of a living organism. So I learned to combine my voice with electronic sounds which I would play on the keyboard of a synthesizer. And in combining the two uh, I was able to get a sense of performance out of the, out of the character and to get some motion, emotion into the, the, the sounds that R2 made because you, you could put an inflection and intonation on the voice and uh, yet you were using non-word sounds to communicate. So it, it, it is just a process of trial and error of getting that and it uh, eventually just clicked in. Lightsabers are one of my favorite sounds, and in fact, it was the very first sound I made for the whole series. For some reason, after I read the script, even though my assignment was first to find a voice for Chewbacca and then a voice for R2, and then, uh, well, maybe come up with some sounds for laser guns and other things, the lightsaber fascinated me. At that time, um, when the script had first come out, uh, they had some paintings that Ralph McQuarrie had done so that there were some concepts visually of what some of these things would look like. And those pictures were very inspiring because they gave a, an idea of the direction we were trying to go in the look of the film. And it was inspiring to me to therefore think up sounds that might fit that kind of visual style. And uh, I could kind of hear the sound in my head of the lightsabers, even though it was just a painting of a lightsaber. I could really just sort of hear the sound. I think maybe somewhere in my subconscious 
I had uh, seen a lightsaber before. Um, and I went to, uh, at that time I was still a graduate student at USC, and I was a projectionist. And we had a projection booth with some very, very old simplex projectors in them. And they had an interlock motor which connected them to the system, which when they just sat there and idled, made a wonderful humming sound. And it would slowly change in pitch, and it would beat against another motor. There were two motors, and they would harmonize with each other. And it was kind of uh, that inspiration. Uh, that, that sound was the inspiration for the lightsaber, and I went and recorded that sound. But it wasn't quite enough. It was just a humming sound. What was missing was kind of a buzzy, sparkling sound, the scintillating element which I was looking for. And that I found one day by uh, accident. I was carrying a microphone across the room between recording. I was recording something over here, and I walked over here with the microphone, passed by a television set, which was on the floor, which was on at the time without the sound turned up, but the microphone passed right behind the picture tube, and as, as it did, this particular microphone produced an unusual hum. It picked up transmission from the television set, and uh, a signal was induced into its uh, sound reproducing mechanism. And that was a great buzz, actually. So I took that buzz, recorded it, and combined it with the projector motor sound, and that the 50-50 kind of combination of those two sounds became the basic lightsaber tone, which was then, once we had established this tone of the lightsaber, of course you had to get the sense of the lightsaber moving, because characters would carry it around, they'd whip it through the air, they would, of course, thrust and slash at each other in fights. And um, to achieve this additional sense of movement, I played the sound over a speaker in a room, just the humming sound, the humming and buzzing combined is an endless uh, sound. And then took another microphone and waved it around in the air next to that speaker so that it would come close to the speaker and go away. You could whip it by. And what happens when you do that by recording with a moving microphone is you get a Doppler shift. You get a pitch shift in the sound. And therefore, you can produce a very authentic uh, uh, facsimile of a moving sound and therefore it gave the lightsaber a sense of movement and it worked well on screen at that point. The walkers were a lot of fun to work on because they were big mechanical beasts. And it was a pleasure sometimes to work on just big machinery rather than just voices. And we knew the walkers were big and they were heavy and they were lumbering about. And because they were animated, they had a certain rhythmic walk to them. And so the objective was to come up with a sound for the walkers to give them a real sense of mass and weight. After all, they were miniatures and they were being animated. And one of the things about one of the drawbacks of animation uh, is that it's hard to produce a, a sense of mass in an object. You know, if you want something to seem like it's many tons or the size of a building, it's, it, it takes particularly good animation in order to create that sense of weight. But we can help that along a great deal with the proper sound. So the walker was made up of different elements. It had motors and it had metal clunks and it had a weapon sound. The principal sound of it foot stomping along, this very big metallic clang, with kind of a rattle and a wrinkle to it, was the sound of a metal shearing machine, which is a big stamping machine in a factory which has rolls of uh, metal come out of a conveyor belt that just cuts them off into pieces. Cuts it, it's like a big uh, chopping block for iron and steel. And uh, Randy Tom, one of the fellows working with me at that time, he went out and recorded some of these metal shearing machines for me, brought the recordings in. I picked parts of the recordings that I liked and made them into the, a rhythmic walk cycle. But in addition to just the metal shearing machine clanging along, I needed a, some big metallic squeaking sounds, kind of like the knee joint squeaking all the time. Every time it would lift its leg, there'd be a big sort of a moaning sound. And that I achieved by uh, playing with the dumpster door, uh, a dumpster that was dropped off at my house one day to fill a in the street to be filled with trash. I'd go out and throw the trash in it and I'd open the lid and it made this wonderful sound because it hadn't been oiled in its entire life. And so that dumpster became a major part of the walker as well. The sound 
sound of explosions has always been a great passion for me. And so when it came to battle scenes or the destruction of the Death Star or anything of that sort, I always got into it quite seriously <laughs> and uh, spent a lot of time recording explosions and weapons and trying to figure out ways to record them to get the maximum visceral effect out of the event. Um, real explosions are very difficult to record because they're so loud and quite often they're so sudden short duration of sound that a normal recording system doesn't get something that's very interesting. It gets a big clap or a big pop or something of that sort. If you listen to explosions often on the, uh, on the news, things recorded in actual warfare, sometimes it doesn't seem to have quite the, the body and the tone range that you are used to hearing in motion pictures. Um, I went out and did a lot of recording of explosions. I uh, went to White Sands Missile Range to record missiles and rockets taking off and impacting and air-to-air -air interceptions. I went to many military bases and recorded uh, tanks shooting and artillery. Uh, I, had, I got myself in a situation once where I was being bombarded by howitzers from about five miles away and I was in a trench and they were sh dropping shells 500 feet out in front of me where my microphones were blew up one pair of microphones, cut cables, put some more out, uh, duct shrapnel, but got some great recordings and I've repeated that experience over and over again over the years, uh, always in a quest which I call the search for the ultimate explosion. And uh, I've gone a great distance in this, but I don't know if I've gotten it yet.